Minister Desmond Lee. Chairman, may I, may I show some visuals at the appropriate juncture to illustrate some points I'm going to make? Thank you. So I'll speak on three areas that MND will continue to strengthen in the coming years. First, our infrastructure resilience. Second, climate resilience. And third, social resilience. Let me begin with strengthening our infrastructure resilience. We often take infrastructure resilience to mean how strong and durable our existing structures are and how well we maintain them. This certainly is important as our buildings start to age, but resilience is also about designing and building better to meet tomorrow's challenges so that our buildings can accommodate higher density living, changing lifestyle needs, and also withstand tougher weather conditions. This means adopting innovative solutions in design and construction. That is why MND continues to invest heavily in research and development in the urban and infrastructure sector. Now, one example is the Housing Development Board. In recent years, it partnered ASTAR to develop the Integrated Environmental Modeler, or the IEM. The IEM is a 3D modeling software that predicts how environmental conditions interact with our town plans. The software can, for example, try to simulate how wind flows through different urban features and open spaces and where solar heat is more likely to build up. This helps our town planners take some of the guesswork out of designing a more livable and sustainable estate. Now they can plan better for open spaces to enjoy good ventilation, plant trees and greenery in the right places to help bring down ambient temperatures. Singapore can be a thought leader in producing innovative urban solutions like IEM. We are both compact and well connected, which is an ideal living testbed for new ideas. Innovations developed here have the potential to be useful in other dense tropical cities. The team that developed IEM recognizes this and they are currently in talks with the industry to see how the IEM can be adapted for commercial use. And I hear they are even looking to bring it overseas. We will continue to support promising research under the Cities of Tomorrow program which builds on the success of the Land and Livability National Innovation Challenge. The projects that we have funded are diverse, but all of them aim to develop practical solutions to the multifaceted challenges that exist in our built environment. For example, in construction technology, we are investing in innovations such as 3D printing to build faster, safer and more cost effectively. In facilities management, we are studying how robots and data analytics can make the job of inspecting building facades safer and more efficient. Ultimately, these innovations aim to improve the lives of people and ensure that our city meets the demands not just of today but of tomorrow. Let me now move on to climate resilience. Various members have spoken about the importance of being responsive to the threats and effects of climate change. We fully agree. It is, essentially, it is especially critical for small, low-lying states like us to act decisively to protect ourselves. We have conducted studies to examine the risks and impact of sea level rise and invested in clean tech solutions so as to move towards becoming a more low-carbon society. Minister Lawrence Wong will speak more about this tomorrow. Today I will speak about an important response to climate change, protecting the diversity and resilience of our natural and urban ecosystems. This is a comprehensive effort that requires planning at different levels. Firstly, at the design level, our colleagues at NParks have put in a lot of thought to embed climate resilience features into our urban green spaces. At One North Park, specially chosen wildflowers and grasses help to filter stormwater runoff naturally. These plants then also serve as a habitat for various species of butterflies, birds, aquatic wildlife, bringing them into the city. Our nature ways, such as the one shown here in Tampanese, replicate the tiered structure of a tropical forest with native trees and shrubs. So not just streetscape, but grown in a particular way to replicate some natural structures. They provide important ecosystem services to people and facilitate ecological connectivity for some species. Secondly, 
On a planning level, we work with our community partners to protect and strengthen our nature reserves and nature areas. We currently have six nature parks adjacent to our nature reserves to, protect, to provide over 250 hectares of protective green buffers. By 2020, we will add two more nature parks, Rifle Range and Thompson, to increase our green buffers to over 370 hectares. Over the next 10 years, we will do more to regenerate forests in our nature parks as well as nature reserves. As part of our Forest Restoration Action Plan, NParks will plant an additional 250,000 native trees and shrubs to restore our, our secondary forests. Third, underpinning all this work are our continued efforts to conserve our native flora and fauna. N Parks will continue to plant more trees. So in the past five years, N Parks has planted an average of 50,000 trees a year, twice what it used to plant in the past. It will restore and enhance more habitats, for example, restoring mangroves at Sungai Bulo and Pulau Ubin, and repopulating corals at the Sisters Island Marine Park. We will implement more species recovery plans and have started this for 50 species of native plants and 10 species of native animals. What you see on the video is the Neptune, Neptune's cup sponge, which is one of the species being carefully rehabilitated in Singapore waters. It was thought to be globally extinct since 1908, but it was rediscovered in Singapore in 2011, the first known rediscovery of the species in the world. And so you see this work of uh, NPARC's officer relocating it to afford better protection from the elements. Another species in our recovery program is the harlequin butterfly. It is rare and little is known about its biology. But NPARC's has been studying it closely in the field and has been relocating it to new sites to establish more populations. Today there's a healthy population at Pasiris Park and work is underway to introduce more at East Coast Park. Now, members also pointed out that development should not come at the expense of greenery. We would like to assure Mr. Lewis Ng, Mr. Chong Ki Hyong, Mr. Ong Ting Kun, and Mr. Pritam Singh that maintaining and enhancing our greenery will continue to be a key pillar of our urban planning strategy. In our post independence years, this was what set us apart from other cities with similar growth strategies. Indeed, as Minister Heng Sui Kiat said in his budget roundup speech, Greening is part of our identity. But our small size as a city-state means that our land and resources are scarce and finite, and the tensions and trade-offs for us when it comes to land use are magnified many times compared to larger countries. This is a reality we live with every day, and our planners are always seized with these challenges. So we have to, be, we have to continue to be judicious about how we use land to meet our needs as a city and as a country, while safe, ensuring that we safeguard land for the aspirations of our children and future generations. In this regard, any decision to clear land and forest cover is not taken lightly. If we do, it is a decision we make after very careful deliberation and interagency discussion, taking into account Singaporeans' needs and the many trade-offs involved. As was in the case of Tengah, which was needed to provide homes over the next two decades for 42,000 families and jobs for more than 20,000 people as the town develops progressively. These are not just difficult trade-offs in the present day between greenery and biodiversity on the one hand and housing and jobs on the other, but trade-offs between the present and the future, between land use for today's needs and keeping land for our children and grandchildren and generations not yet born. At the same time, in response to Mr. Lewis Ng's question, we work to ensure that when development does take place, proposals are thoroughly examined for any potential environmental impact, among other assessments. Our Environmental Impact Assessment, or EIA framework, covers all nature reserves, nature areas, other sensitive natural areas, as well as marine and coastal areas. Those who propose development close to those areas are required to consult our technical agencies on their plans together with URA and MND. And these technical agencies include the National Parks Board. We take a prudent approach to this consultation, 
If we have reason to believe that the project may significantly impact the environment, then the developer will be asked by technical agencies to conduct a further environmental study. And we would like to assure the member that studies are undertaken in an independent and objective manner by specialists who have every interest to maintain their professional standing. And the study reports are also carefully assessed by technical agencies such as NPARCS, AVA, MPA and NEA to ensure their adequacy. In addition, to reiterate my previous answer to the member's question in this House, we will make the findings of such EIAs publicly available unless specific considerations require otherwise. That said, our review of the EIA framework is ongoing. MND and the technical agencies are studying how best to strengthen our policies and processes to ensure the framework rem remains robust for the future. Now this brings me to my third and final area of focus. Our green spaces not only contribute to our climate resilience, they also bring people together and are an important part of our social resilience. Singaporeans have reason to be proud of our distinctive greenery and rich biodiversity. Our common spaces allow us to interact with one another and bond with our family and friends. More and more citizens are stepping forward to care for our green spaces. And we are indeed fortunate to have over 45,000 volunteers who work closely with us to protect and enhance our greenery and nature areas. For example, our community gardeners tend to more than 1,400 community in bloom gardens across the island. And our biodiversity beach patrol volunteers help monitor key stretches of our beaches. Meanwhile, NPARC's extensive Friends of the Park communities continue to see people from all walks of life and all interests coming together with a common love for nature and open spaces. Now, Mr. Dennis Tan highlighted concerns about the safe use of our park connectors and he showed us a, a photograph of that. NPARC has installed more safety features to enhance uh, safe use of PCNs. Additional lighting, speed regulating strips and, advi and advisory signs have been put up. NPARCS has also installed advisory signs at high usage parks and PCNs to remind users to stay on track and give way. And NPARCS conducts outreach programs to promote the safe use of PCNs, including lane usage and appropriate speed limits. And NPARCS is working together with LTA on joint enforcement efforts. <coughs> but the friends of the PCN have also been contributing to our efforts. Chaired by an avid cyclist and nature lover, Mr. Woon Tai Woon, the friends of the PCN have led the charge on ground-up initiatives, reaching out to PSCN users to promote safe riding, like helping with tra track painting and public signage, encouraging safe riding etiquette through the Share the Track program, and most recently, creating a video promoting the, pers the responsible use of personal mobility devices. We will also activate more community nodes for citizens to enjoy. In 2017, we announced the start of trail enhancement works along the rail corridor. The continuous green trail stretches 24 kilometers from the north to the south of Singapore and is used by many as a place to cycle and track. Today, I'm happy to share that we have plans to develop the former Bukit Timah fire station into an additional recreational node along the rail corridor. This former fire station is strategically located at the intersection of the rail corridor and the Coast to Coast Trail, which we launched quite recently too. And we envision it to be a base for visitors to explore the nature and heritage attractions in the area, including Bukit Timah Nature Reserve, Dairy Farm Nature Park, and the former Ford Factory. It will also be home to a new visitor center for the nature parks in the area and will host other nature, heritage, and recreational users. And we'll announce more details later this year. Finally, we will reinforce social resilience in the places that Singaporeans call home. We continue to ensure that our residential communities are served well by high quality social and community facilities. This means ensuring that community facilities are right-sighted and sized appropriately to support cohesive and multi-generational neighborhoods. For example, the future Pungul Town Hub will feature a public library, a community center, hawker center, and health services, all co-located for one-stop convenient access for our residents. It will also have a cycling path that connects to the larger Pongol cycling network around it. The mix of amenities was carefully planned so as to meet the needs of the current demographics of residents. And as Pongol evolves, 
so too will the offerings of Pongo Town Hub. Now let me briefly address the remaining cuts. Engineer Dr. Lee Biwa made a request to increase heavy vehicle parking options in Yishun. Public heavy vehicle parking is popular as it tends to be cheaper and closer to residential areas and that is where the tension arises with residents who are concerned about heavy vehicles entering residential built out areas. But of course it's also more convenient for drivers to park near home, especially given the hours that they operate. Unfortunately, while we plan carefully to ensure sufficient heavy vehicle lots at a national level, it may not always be possible to fully meet local demand, especially near heavily built up residential areas. These are in relation to site constraints, concerns about safety, noise and other disamenities. So we encourage drivers to look into private heavy vehicle parking lot options as well as alternatives in neighbouring areas, but also encourage employers to take responsibility, help the drivers find the right spaces to park the company vehicles. But we will certainly work with uh, Dr. Lee Biwa to look at uh, requirements in the Republic of Yishun. I would like to thank Mr. Gan Tiampo and Mr. Mohammad Faisal Abdul Manap for their suggestions to optimise car park use. Some car parks already allow day and night parking, season parking. And since private cars, heavy vehicles and commercial vehicles tend to need parking at different times, available space is often already used optimally. And separately, agencies have also allowed parking lots that do not have traffic and site constraints to double up as heavy vehicle spaces for short time periods. But we continue to look out for other car parks which can be further optimised to support dual use and will continue to explore the ideas that members have raised. Chairman, we have come far together, but we have more to do to build a thriving and dynamic city, develop comfortable homes and neighbourhoods, and protect our natural and built environment. And we look forward to continued support of all our members. Thank you.